video or phone meeting with you to go over your Lao plan and look at each piece one by one and kind of talk about all of the updates that might need to be built into your Lao plan. Um, before we have that meeting, though, it might be a benefit for you um, to take a look at this Lao plan template and guidance that's linked at the top of this slide. And while the template is not a requirement, um, I think it is helpful. So I certainly advise you to, to consider using it, take a look at it. It contains um, all of the information that a Lao plan must have, and it walks you through section by section with some prompting questions so that you can ensure that your Lao plan does cover absolutely everything that's needed in there. As I review Lao plans submitted by various districts this year, um, if you could go back, Cheryl, just for a moment. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, some of the common issues that I've come across that I'll just key you into so that you may notice if, if your Lao plan has some of these, um, that there is often um, an explanation of how English learners are identified that includes multiple criteria. For example, a Lao plan might say, uh, in addition to the language use survey and the screening tool, we will also consider classroom observations, teacher feedback, parent input, that kind of thing. Uh, but the state of Maine identification policy for students who are English learners really comes down to just two things, which are the language use survey and the English language proficiency screener. Those are the only two things that can be considered in whether a student is identified as an English learner or not. Another common thing that I've come across is um, listing out some identification tools that might have been used in past years, um, but are now um, not up to date with what's required to be used statewide. And so in that Lao plan template, you will see a chart that describes by grade what the required screening assessments are. So I recommend just simply copying that chart and in incorporating it into your Lao plan, and that way you're sure that it's up to date. Uh, another thing that, that um, needs updating is the terminology that's used in this field. So in past years, we would refer to students as LEP or limited English proficient or FEP, fully English proficient. Um, those terms are no longer in use here at the state. Um, and in fact, the term LEP, limited English proficient, uh, has really gone out of style simply because it, it is a kind of deficit based approach to talking about these students. So instead, we recommend using um, referring to the students as students who are English learners and referring to the field or the subject matter uh, as ESOL, which is English for speakers of other languages. And finally, um, if you include information about the language use survey in your Lao plan, you want to make sure that you're referring to it by its current name. It was in the past called the home language survey, um, but the current language use survey is available on the main DOE website for you to use, and that is a link to it directly right there. And of course, the resource and policy guide, which is called Serving Maine's English Learners, contains lots of useful information that you may use to uh, to complete your lab plan. Okay, thank, thank you. you April. Thank you, April. All right, Travis, could you take away A02? Sure, thanks, Cheryl. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, again, as Cheryl has alluded to, my name is Travis Stoudy. I'm the state coordinator for Title IV. Um, item A2 is something I essentially volunteered to uh, take under my purview here for the team as it deals specifically with um, comprehensive needs assessments and uh, school-wide plans. And so if your district is in a situation where um, item A2 at its current stage does not meet statutory requirements, uh, there's a couple of uh, common issues that I've seen uh, statewide with, with the submissions that have been coming in. And so you'll predominantly fall into one of uh, two categories with this item, being that uh, the items you've submitted to date are either um, just simply out of date, uh, meaning that we have not received any sort of updated CNA document from the initial one your district would have completed a couple of years ago, um, or the district may have only been, or excuse me, the document may have only been partially updated by the district, uh, meaning that, you know, there may have been some updates to section two of the document, which predominantly deals with um, school level uh, district data. Um, and, but the other pieces that serve to uh, interpret that data and set goals for the school or district may not have been updated. 
And so basically, if you're in this sort of situation where you have um, some sort of problem to, to address with regard to item A2, it's largely just the need to update the plan, um, whether it be your district CNA or perhaps an individual school-wide plan within your district. Um, now, when I say the document needs to be up to date, because we're monitoring for um, FY20, uh, it would mean that data would need to at least include the 18-19 school year at a minimum. Um, granted, we're, we're kind of well into the, the subsequent school year at this point. Um, so if you're in a position of, of simply working to update this plan now, you're welcome certainly to include um, more recent data if you have it available. But in order to meet the statutory requirements for the FY20 monitoring cycle, you have to at least have the document updated with 1819 school year data. Um, and again, that means updating not just section two, which is that section that focuses primarily on data, um, but updating the entirety of the document cognizant of any new data that you would um, leverage. And I believe that's all I had on this one, Cheryl. Thank you, Travis. And I think we're coming back to April for A07. Yes, thank you very much. So the next item is, again, uh, it's related to the Lao plan, of course, because it's about identifying students who are English learners. And item A7 is really just a review of documentation related to that identification process. And we ask that you provide at least three um, language use surveys and preferably from the current year or um, from the most recent year so that you can show that you're using the updated statewide required language use survey. There are lots of different versions of this document floating around. Um, some of them have been used at the state level in past years. Some of them were created independently by districts, but with the advent of the Every Student Succeeds Act, we did require the single language use survey that's been provided by the Maine Department of Education to be used in all districts statewide. And that is, of course, on the Maine DOE website. It's also been provided in 25 languages in addition to English. So please do feel free to make use of those translations. Um, so when you submit items for this, uh, when you submit documentation for this monitoring item, um, make sure that you're sending in completed language use surveys, not just the blank copies. Uh, again, that you do send at least three would be ideal. Um, that you make sure it's the updated language use survey or if your district hasn't currently been implementing that updated language use survey, that you may be requested to submit uh, an action plan for how you will implement that required form. And then um, if your district hasn't had a need to screen a student, meaning that you haven't had a language use survey that shows a language other than English, then you may not be able to provide language proficiency screener reports and that's perfectly understandable. Uh, but if any of your language use surveys show an, a language other than English, we would expect to see language proficiency screener reports using those required screeners that I mentioned uh, talking about the last monitoring item. And all of that information is captured in the report or in the um, resource guide that Shelley shared the link in the chat to. Um, that is of course on the slides as well. So once you have a copy of the slides, you'll be able to click right to that. Or if you just wanna reach out to me, I'll point you to it directly as well. So that's it for that one. Thank you, April. All right, and A9, I'm going to take on because Amelia Lyons, who is our McKinney Bento Homeless Liaison up here at the Maine Department of Education, could not be with us this morning. So I wanted to be able to get this information out to you. And I have served in the past capacity as a homeless liaison, so I'm somewhat familiar with this. This is talking about the best interest determination when you're having those conversations as a committee of stakeholders. Uh, Amelia wanted to point out some of the common mistakes are, well, one common mistake is using transportation, the cost and availability as a consideration in best interest. We all know that transportation cost and availability is a factor, but that is a factor that has to be determined within the school district and cannot be part of the consideration when you're really looking at best interest determination. And some of the reminders that she wanted to point out were that best interest determination decisions are made, are made based on student-centric uh, 
factors and she has posted a link in the um, slide and so that will be available with a copy of this slideshow it has a checklist that really points out the factors that you need to take into consideration when as a group of stakeholders including um, sometimes including the student if the student's old enough to be able to voice his or her opinion and the parents um, of that student when making those best interest determinations and any other stakeholders within the school district and we always um, want to assume that the school of origin is in the best interest with priority given to the request of the student and family taken into consideration so amelia wanted to make sure we pointed those things out that's it for that one. We'll move on to B4. Jackie, I think you're taking that one. Right. Um, the item in B4 is really asking for um, a notification to be provided annually at the beginning of the school year to inform parents that they have the right to request any policies or procedures uh, regarding student participation in local and state assessments, which would also include any opt-out procedures. So what this is, we're looking for a copy of that initial notification that um, you provided to parents. It's very similar to the um, annual notification that you provide to parents that indicates they have the right to request the professional qualifications of their child's teacher. So annually, beginning of the year, the notification needs to go out. Um, you also need to be prepared to um, to respond with information should a parent um, request this information. Or you could, within the notification, provide all the links to the policies and any information assessment Q&As that you have on your website. You may be able to post that in the notification as well as provide them with indication of who they can contact if they have additional questions. Um, so some of the information that you would probably provide to them is policies. And if you are going to reference some policies, you, you want to make sure that you're providing them with the, um, if you give them the link to your alt, to where all your policies are, make sure you tell them see policy ILA or IK or ILB. Um, make sure that they have those references. Um, but you would need to be prepared to provide them all your note, your policies, your procedures required uh, regarding testing, any Q and A documents that you've produced, um, that type of item. Um, for this question, what we've been given recently was um, the link to the parent notice for the MEA. So that doesn't meet this requirement at that point. It's overall, both state and local, it's referencing student participation in state and local assessments and any information you have regarding that. So I guess with that, we can go on to the next one. <laughs> yes, you can. Um, the next one um, deals with the uh, continued testing transparency. This item wants, um, wants you to create a chart of all your um, assessments, both state and local assessments, um, sim very similar to you know, Travis was talking about the CNA, the Comprehensive Needs Assessment. If you look at item 6A in that Comprehensive Needs Assessment, that's, that's a great chart to begin with. Um, and this chart wants to um, include those um, elements listed, <laughs> um, the grade, le grade level references, subject matter assessed, purpose for which the assessment is designed and used, the source of the requirement for the assessment, on this one, the source of the requirement for state assessment is section 1111, little b in parentheses, and the number two in parentheses. That would be the source for state required assessments. Um, the amount of time students will spend taking the assessment, the schedule for the assessment, and the timeline and format for disseminating the results. So this, this chart should be provided put out or placed out on your website and parents informed that this is available to them. Sorry about that. My computer is doing its own thing today. I apologize that it keeps moving on its own. 
Uh, that's fun. I'm done. Are you all set, Jackie? Yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Moving right along, we're going to have Monique take on B8 slash B12. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to see you. And um, B8 and B12, I put those together and the running joke is that I have a vitamin deficiency, but I really don't. Um, so uh, what we found with the B8 was that many districts were submitting um, the KVF policy, which is the requirement to actually, for the board to create a, a parent involvement policy. What um, should have been, or what the actual district, what we really needed was the actual district policy, which is sometimes labeled KBF1 or KBF2, it depends on, on your district. Um, and keep in mind that, um, and this is where the B12 um, piece comes in, and that is the B12 was, you when you do a parent involvement policy, you're also supposed to make sure that you do an annual evaluation with the parent, with parent participation of the content and the effectiveness of the policy. Um, so you need, that's where that B12 is. So we, we got surveys from districts based on different activities that districts or schools had had involving parent involvement, but it didn't tell us what they did with the surveys. Did they adjust their policy? Did they adjust the activities? Did they adjust, adjust their strategies? So that's part of where that B12 comes in. It's not just the survey, it's what do you do with the survey and how does it impact the, um, the strategies and the services that you provide parents um, along the lines of family engagement. In addition, you need to identify the barriers to greater participation by parents, parent activities outlined in the policy, especially for parents of economically disadvantaged, disabled, limited English proficiency, um, have limited literacy and um, racial or ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, and then like I already said, you wanna make sure you're using evaluation findings to design strategies for more effective parent involvement. So it's not that you're just, oh, we had our math night and our, and our parent, uh, our math and our literacy night and we did a survey and parents said, great. How did that impact the strategies in, the, in your plan or your policy um, going um, in the future? And then I think the next one, yeah. And B9 is the school policy. So B8 was for the district policy or procedure and B9 is for the school policy or procedure. Um, and I, the district pointed out to me and I wanna make sure that I'm clear that um, you probably have a policy at the district level, but you might more have a plan or a, a plan at the elementary level because you're probably not gonna have a board policy for a school unless, it's a smaller school district. So common pitfalls, several districts submitted a district policy instead of an individual school policy or procedure or plan. Um, they submitted school plan with NCLB references. Um, they submitted a home school compact instead of the school policy. Um, and they submitted the same policy for multiple schools in the same district. Um, each school that receives Title I funds has to have their own policy, procedure, plan. Um, I like to call it a plan. It, make, it seems more um, inclusive of what's going on in your school. Um, if you have five elementary schools that are getting Title I, all five of the elementary schools need to have their own plan. And it needs to be, um, this is where your, um, your B12 comes in. And that is, it needs to reflect the parents in that school, the families in that school. So that's why that parent piece and that family piece is so important. Um, the policy needs to be updated. So if your school has moved from a targeted to a school-wide, that needs to be reflected in the, in the, um, in the plan. Um, it needs to reflect ESSA requirements. So if you have any NCLB references, make sure you update those. Um, involve parents in the planning, reviewing and improvement of the school um, uh, the school-wide or the Title I, depending on if it's targeted or school-wide plan, and also update the homeschool compact to include also all ESSA requirements. Thank you, Monique. All right, moving on to B16. Travis, would you mind taking that one? Sure thing. So uh, folks, B16 pertains specifically to um, any districts that receive Title IV Part A funds um, and who also don't transfer those funds elsewhere, 
uh, meaning that you both receive an allocation of Title IV funds and you leverage them under Title IV purview. Um, and basically what this, this item refers to in statute is a requirement uh, under Title IV legislation that uh, says districts receiving uh, Title IV funds have to engage with a wide variety of stakeholders in the design and development of their funding application to the state, um, which includes and specifically calls out in statute both parents and students. Uh, and so for those folks that have um, issues related to B16, it's largely because the uh, documentation or evidence that you were providing to us uh, didn't quite um, provide the level of evidence we would need in terms of having engaged with um, students and parents or, or essentially stakeholders that are outside of the school district. Um, so in order to be able to address this for your district and, and essentially resolve any you know, quote findings that you might have related to B16, uh, what we're really looking for is evidence uh, that the district has engaged parents and students uh, regarding the um, programming, uh, funding, et cetera, that's inclusive of the ESEA application. So for example, uh, your district might be able to produce um, you know, meeting minutes uh, from a meeting that may have included uh, parents and students in discussion around you know, ESEA uh, projects and, and things of that nature. Um, you might have a, an agenda and participant list for a family engagement event that might have taken place at the district where you know, district programming um, and the application may have been discussed. It's really those sorts of things that we're looking for that clearly delineate that um, parent and student input were solicited um, and taken into account when planning out the district's uh, application. Now, I understand, you know, based on the, the feedback and documentation that we received from many folks, uh, you may be in a situation where you simply um, don't have that information or, or may not have formally gone through that process, um, that's okay. Um, but there are gonna be a, a few additional steps needed to be able to resolve this item. Um, the first being that we would ask that your next response um, document for this particular item would outline uh, a brief narrative for your plan for starting to uh, engage students and parents. Uh, in conversations around your application um, and the programming that's included within it. And then ultimately we would need to see still uh, that evidence, you know, be it meeting minutes or agendas, participant lists, what have you, uh, that demonstrates that the district did engage uh, both students and parents in uh, talks around their ESE application. Um, so again, just if you have the information, please send it to us. Um, if you don't send us your kind of plan of action here for the, the short term, um, with the understanding that ultimately we will still need um, evidence that that engagement took place. Um, and just, you know, do your best to, to continue engaging um, everyone in your school community, um, be they, you know, internal or external to the school district. Thank you, Travis. All right, B17, I will take that one again because Amelia Lyons, our McKinney Venture Homeless Liaison, is not with us today. This is um, showing the access to early educational opportunities for families experiencing homeless, homelessness. You know, what, how are you making sure to provide that access to early educational opportunities? And then, you know, how do families experiencing homelessness know these early educational services are available? So Amelia said that SAU should have on their enrollment questionnaire, having uh, consider your enrollment documents and asking about other children in the family who may qualify for preschool services and or referrals, and then keep a referral service log. What collaborations with preschool providers, such as Head Start, Early Intervention, or other preschool, preschool programs do you have? How do you refer families to community partnerships, and what does this process look like? So it's about being able to describe how you're trying to meet um, needs of families experiencing homelessness. And then making sure that you have flyers posted throughout your district and community 
with updated contact info for the uh, McKinney Vento uh, liaison. All right. And then Christy, you're going to take on EO2, please. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Um, all right, so um, from the fiscal side of things, uh, the, the one thing that uh, I saw the most troubles with was um, equipment inventory. Um, basically, what I was seeing is um, a lack of policy, written policy outlining uh, what the procedure is to track and maintain equipment. Um, so one of the things I was trying to um, get through to everyone was that um, you should have a policy in place even if you haven't purchased any equipment with title funds. That's just in the case that in the future you do choose to do that, um, that that policy is still there. Um, so we need to be able to see that. Um, and the, the other thing um, that I saw a lot was um, everybody was following the federal rule of the threshold of uh, how much something should be worth before you start tracking it. And the state rule um, is $500 or more or highly walkable. Um, now that rule is changing, um, but for the school year 1819, we're going to continue to follow that rule. Um, and so another thing that I just wanted to point out is just what some what your inventory should look like so the parts of that um you should have an identification serial number on there the source of the funding how much of that funding was used to purchase it um, the acquisition date um, the cost of the item uh, where it's kept the use and condition the disposition data and the inventory should be taken about every two years um, so that is that for inventory. Thank you, Christy. You're welcome. And that concludes our slide presentation for today. And keep in mind that we're going to give you access to that information. And we also have uh, our contact people right there for every region. Uh, those are the contacts that have expertise in within your region geographically. And then if you need specific information related to a particular title, they can reach out to somebody else on the team to get that information. So that's our entire presentation today. Did we have any questions posed in the chat box team? Cheryl, sure. there was a question from um, Amanda a little bit earlier on. I think she might have been asking if we have a sample best interest determination form. Amanda, is that what you're looking for? Yes, that's correct. Actually, yes, Amelia does have one of those, and I believe that's part of that checklist that is linked in the slideshow, but I'll make sure to check with Amelia and verify that, and if it's not, we'll make sure we get that out as well. And Jackie, you asked if I was referring to before five or eight or nine, and I would take examples and samples for all of that. <laughs> Please. I can email you, Jackie, and, and ask for it specifically. Um, no, I, that's okay. I, I'll, I'll, see, I'll pull it together and get it to you. And we'll eventually get these, my B4, B5 um, documents out, posted to the web. Cheryl, there was also a question from Jody, um, I believe directed for Travis, which asks, may survey results from students and parents be acceptable for input for Title IV? So Jody, can you tell me a little bit more about what, um, what specific survey results you have available? And the only reason I ask is because the, the requirement is for the the application itself, not necessarily the use specifically of Title IV funds. Um, and so whereas in Maine, we have a, a consolidated application process and not kind of siloed applications for each individual title, uh, the requirement would be more uh, soliciting parent and student feedback on like the entirety of um, 
ESEA supports, not specifically uh, the Title IV program. But do you have something like that as far as so survey we, results are concerned? Thank you. We have survey information. We survey regularly parents and students. Yep. Um, and it's about global issues and how are things going, what's going well, what um, is missing um, in this academic area, what's going well in this academic area, sort of a district-wide um, surveys we do regularly. Would that be considered appropriate for any of the feedback? Um, so the so there's questions around along the lines of you know, where are some areas that you would like to see additional supports for your child and, and those sorts of things? Yes, I'm sorry that I'm having a hard time bringing up no, the specific fine. questions. Um, um, but yeah, and, and specifically recently, the, the questions were, did you um, receive enough support? Um, that type of, do you feel your child had the appropriate support for academics, for social emotional? Um, but it's not specific to um, an application. It just asks questions that are relevant to the application. So I didn't yeah, know if I we think, had to do something I think separately. Jody, so long as um, there's that clear delineation of you know, specific feedback that can be leveraged for informing what's done in the application. Um, so you know, what sort of supports might we be missing now? What some additional types of programs or services you might like to see for your child? Those types of things that give you specific input that can then be leveraged in the development of the application. Because essentially we're just, we're looking for that, that communication channel, right? So whether it be a face-to-face -face meeting, a survey, what have you, as long as there's that feedback loop um, so that students and parents can provide input into essentially what becomes the ESE application for the district, that's really the evidence we're looking for. That's the, the requirement we're trying to make sure everybody's meeting. Mm -hmm. So if you can do that through a means by a survey or, or even something else that maybe I haven't mentioned, um, mm -hmm. We're more than willing to take a look at that. So would also um, minutes, um, dates, et cetera, from task force, different task force is task forces. <laughs> um, would that, would that um, also work like if you had an equity task force, which is pretty central to a lot of um, supports or lack of supports. It's an exploration of that. Would that be appropriate in that area also for feedback loop? when parents and students are part of it? Provided, yeah, provided that you have all the relevant stakeholder groups as part of that work, yep. Great, thanks a ton, I appreciate you guys. Happy to help. I see that uh, Gail had a question about um, inventory. And she's, she I says, can ask it out loud if okay. you want. Just, sure. <laughs> um, that so, you know, we, how long, it's basically how long do you keep items on the inventory, items that were purchased with federal, federal funds after they've been disposed of? So they've, you know, been deemed unusable by the IT department. Mm -hmm. um, how many okay. Years? So you just need to make a note that it was disposed of like it's on the inventory list but it just has the um disposal date um how much it was worth at the time um so if it was worth anything then obviously that money needs to be returned um so basically it just needs to be a note on the inventory list we need to be able to see where that equipment went so i guess the answer is it just needs to stay on there but just as a with a disposed date does that make sense? Yeah, so even items purchased in 2012, 13 stay on that inventory. It's just big, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose that if you wanted to create a disposition list, you could do it, that if you have yeah, a lot I just of don't, it. I don't want to track them anymore unless yeah. it is legally required. And it seems like there's, there's a, you know, either state or federal rule about how long things need to be um, kept. And so I was just hoping there was something around the inventory that would allow me to move items off. But yeah. I'm not, I'm hearing no. So. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. 
Thank you, Christy. Other questions, team? I just asked how we submit the documentation. Do we just submit it through email to like, would I submit it to Monique or do I submit it through the same portal that we used the first time? A lot of nodding of the heads on the team. Travis, you want to take that one? I was gonna, I was gonna say Amanda's mine. So um, <laughs> Amanda, you can just email it to me. Just make sure it's either uh, a PDF or a Word. Um, we don't do Google very well here. So just PDF or Word and we that's the most helpful. You can just email it to me as attachment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, for, for anyone who's resubmitting items, just by all means, email them to whoever your regional program manager is. Um, we use the FTP site for the initial upload, but at this stage in the game, email is just a, a much easier process for everyone involved. Right, we're moving into the closure of this monitoring cycle. One other item that was in the chat box was uh, the due date for these items. And if we remember the due date was originally March 1st, but then we went on pause quickly thereafter. Now we're coming off pause. The new due date is by November 17th to try to get that documentation into us. Any other questions in the chat box? Or anybody want to unmute themselves and ask a question specifically to the team? Without hearing anything else, then we'll end our presentation at this time. Keep in mind that we will get this slideshow out to you via our website and via the GEMS portal. And also, if you have any specific questions that arise after this presentation, don't hesitate to reach out to your regional program manager or Amelia Lyons for the homeless liaison. She uh, will respond to your emails. So make it a great day, everybody. Take care of yourselves and those around you. We look forward to continued conversation with you at a later time. Thank you.